Ok, um, bien, hola a todos, buen día, eh, habla Fernando Gil, soy residente de segundo año de medicina, gracias a todos por conectarse. Hoy tendremos una sesión de razonamiento diagnóstico con el doctor André Mansur, una sesión que esperamos pueda ser interactiva. Eh, eh, pues bueno, el, el, doctor, el doctor Mansur es un erudito de la clínica, él es... Es médico internista, tiene su práctica en Portland, Oregon. Eh, es profesor asociado de, de la Universidad de Ciencia y Salud de Oregon. Es autor de múltiples publicaciones eh, en revistas indexadas con una eh, inclinación particular por los signos físicos presentes en distintas entidades clínicas. Es autor además del libro Frameworks for Internal Medicine. Y fue precisamente a través de este libro que yo lo conocí y a través de Twitter que pude contactarlo. Y pues sin más preámbulo, le cedo la palabra al doctor. Thank you very much, doctor, for taking the time to do this lecture for us. You're very welcome, Fernando, and thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, I was looking at, at pictures of your hospital last night, and I wish, I only wish I was there in person. It's a beautiful institution, a beautiful hospital, and I wish I was there with you guys in person, but um, this will have to do for now. And thank you again for inviting me to give this talk and thank you all for joining. As I mentioned in the chat, please feel free to use the chat box to, I'll, this is an interactive talk, I'll ask you questions. Feel free to use the chat to answer them. If you have questions of your own, go ahead and, and uh, ask them in the chat. And you know, if I see it, I'll answer the question then and there. If not, I'll, we'll get to it at the end of the talk. Um, So this talk is about diagnostic reasoning and it will borrow heavily from concepts featured in my textbook, Frameworks for Internal Medicine. We should begin by asking the question, what is diagnostic reasoning? And to me, diagnostic reasoning is the skillful acquisition and use of clues from the patient's history, exam, and other data to make a diagnosis, similar to the way a detective will gather and use clues from a crime scene to solve a case. And it, again, it's the acquisition and use of, of clues with an emphasis on acquisition. You could have the same crime scene with the same information in it, and you could have 10 different detectives evaluate that crime scene. And some of them are gonna glean important pieces of information from that crime scene that others glossed over or missed entirely. And the same is true in medicine. As clinicians, we have to gather those clues from the patient in order to later use them to make a diagnosis. And you know, the process of making a diagnosis is a skill in an art form that requires understanding and lots of practice. And I really think that this is where we should be focused on in terms of student and resident education. Uh, we spend an awful lot of time teaching treatment and management and not enough time teaching the diagnostic process. Um, once a diagnosis has been made, That's the hard part. You know, once you've made the diagnosis of acute pericarditis, that's the hard part. Then you can always look up The treatment, whether it's an N, which NSAID it is, uh, colchicine, what the dose is, etc. But the process of making a diagnosis is not so easy and straightforward. To make a diagnosis, a clinician must, at the very least, do three things: go through three steps. First, the clinician has to understand what information is important to acquire from a particular case. You don't want to be the type of doctor that asks a head-to-toe review of systems, hoping to stumble upon a clue or perform a head-to-toe physical examination hoping to stumble upon a clue, or order all the labs you can imagine uh, hoping to find some abnormality. You want to let the information from the case as it comes in direct you to ask the right questions to gather the right findings on physical examination. Now, it's not enough to know what information is important to acquire from a case. You have to have the skills to acquire that information. For example, if you know that the lung exam is important in a particular case, well, that's useless unless you have the skills to actually examine the lung. If you have, unless you have the skills to, you know, percuss that dullness or hear those crackles. Um, so again, it's not enough to know what information is important to acquire. You have to have the skills to go acquire that information. And then finally, we take those clues that we've gathered and we synthesize them to make a diagnosis. And all three of these steps are related. Uh, without one, you can't do two. Without two, you can't do three. And without three, you can't make a diagnosis. Standardized tests 
uh, play a role in medical education. Um, but to me, they, they, they sort of create this fantasy world where they give you all of the clues uh, that you would need in a case to solve it. They skip over steps one and two, which is knowing what information is important to acquire and having the skills to acquire that information. They assume that you have those first two steps and they give you all the clues. They tell you that the patient traveled to India last month, that there's an S3 Gallup on, on exam. In the real world, in reality, you know, patients don't come to you with signs saying, I traveled to you know, Africa last month or I have an S3 Gallup, listen right here. They don't do that. So the clinician has to, number one, identify that travel history is important in this case, gather that history. In the example of the S3 Gallup, the clinician has to, number one, understand that the heart exam is important in this case. Number two, has to be able to, to listen to, to the heart properly. Number three, has to be able to recognize the S3 Gallup. And number four, has to synthesize that S3 Gallup into the case and understand how it, how it affects the case and the diagnostic, uh, the differential diagnosis. And so it's really multi-layered. And this is why computers will never replace clinicians. I think we can all imagine a world, and it may already exist, where there's a machine or an instrument, and you input information into that machine, and it will output a diagnosis. Some, someone has to gather the clues that goes into that machine, and that someone is a clinician. So uh, clinicians will always have a role in, in making a diagnosis and in patient care. And I'm going to illustrate this point, how important it is to know when information is important to gather and to be to, able to gather those uh, that information. I'm going to illustrate how important those first two steps are by illustrating three cases. And these are three cases, three patients who presented with dyspnea or shortness of breath. So let's look at the first patient. There are three pictures here. One of the patient's mouth, one of his hands, and one of his chest wall. And feel free to use the chat at, the, at this time to, to, to tell us what, what findings are present here in this case. And how can you unify it to make a diagnosis? Well, in the first picture, there you go. Great, great. Isaac has it right. So high arch palate, arachnodactyly, there is a chest scar. There's also a chest wall deformity in the form of pectus carinatum. It's kind of difficult to see because of the depth of the, that the photo was taken, but there is a chest wall deformity. And how could you put all of these findings together? What, what are these all suggestive of? What condition? Marfan syndrome, exactly. Perfect, you guys. And so, you know, again, if, if this information is given to you in this way, these clues are lined up next to each other, these photographs. Or on a standardized test, they might simply tell you the patient has a high arched palate, arachnodactyly, and a chest wall deformity. I, I would think that most clinicians, or at least it's much easier to arrive at the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome when these clues are given to you in this way. But you want to be the clinician that can not only synthesize this information and these clues to make the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome, but you also want to be the clinician who recognizes that it's important to look in the patient's mouth. Who when Marfan syndrome, you know, uh, pops into your head or is on your differential, you know that it's important to look at the mouth. Not only is it important to look at the mouth, but you have the skills to identify high arch palate. You know that it's important to look at the patient's hands. Not only that, but you have the skills to identify arachnodactyly. And finally, you know to look at the chest wall and you have the skills to identify a chest wall deformity. That's the complete clinician, one who can do all three steps, not just come up with a diagnosis based on clues that are given to you. And we're not done with this case. This patient presented with dyspnea. So I'll, I'll ask you guys again, what condition can patients with Marfan syndrome develop that can lead to shortness of breath? And um, let me ask a more specific question. What, what valvular heart disease do patients with Marfan syndrome develop that can lead to dyspnea? Could be an aortic aneurysm. Exactly. And what does that do to the uh, when the aorta dilates, what does that do to the, the aortic valve? It dilates that ring and patients with Marfan syndrome can develop aortic regurgitation, which can certainly lead to dyspnea. So now you're thinking aortic regurgitation is a possibility in this case. So 
now you have a hypothesis. And when you go listen to the heart, now you're anticipating what you might hear in the heart if this patient has aortic regurgitation. And everything in medicine is about anticipation. I never want to order a study where, you know, let's say it's an EKG or even labs. And I, 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 don't, I don't ever want to be surprised by what I see when I order those tests. I want to always be able to anticipate what I might be able to see. And, the, and on an exam, it's, uh, anticipation is critical. The eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. So anticipation is, is key in medicine. And so you anticipate that you might hear a diastolic murmur on exam in this patient when you listen to the heart. And in fact, that's exactly what we hear in this case. So you hear a decrescendo diastolic murmur right over Herb's point, which is consistent with aortic regurgitation. Now, you're thinking aortic regurgitation is uh, very likely in this case. Now, what would you expect to see in the patient's neck? What, what would the carotid pulse look like in a patient with aortic regurgitation? You might expect to see exactly a bounding pulse. And in the neck, this is called Corrigan's pulse. And so you look in the neck with this in mind, and that's indeed exactly what you see, a bounding carotid pulse. And you begin to put all of these clues together and you synthesize these clues and you make a diagnosis in this case of aortic insufficiency. Now, again, you want to be the clinician that is able to acquire these clues from the patient's history and their examination to make the diagnosis. It's much easier to just do step three, which is to synthesize this information, but that's not how real life works. You have to, as a clinician, gather the clues that you later use to make the diagnosis. Let's move to uh, patient number two. So what do you notice? We're looking at this patient's jugular venous pulse. And what do you notice? What finding is present here? And hopefully the video is coming through okay and it's not blurry for you guys. So here we see the jugular venous pulse right in the middle and as the patient breathes in, look how it climbs up the neck. See, now it's all the way at the top of the neck near the angle of the jaw. That is Kussmaul's sign. Caesar is absolutely right. Daniel's right. And so this patient has Kussmaul's sign. And what else do you notice here on the patient's chest wall, this mark right here underneath the logo? You see that, this, this bluish colored mark? Does anybody know what that is? Let's say he had several of these marks arra arranged on his chest. That's absolutely right. This is a radiation tattoo marker. Evidence that this patient received radiation therapy to the chest some time ago. And how could you put these two clues together? Coup small sign and radiation to the chest to make a diagnosis. What underlying diagnosis could be made here? Thinking back to our computer, if we took these two clues and, and we put it into the computer, yes, Isaac, constrictive pericarditis. Yes, these are exactly. So if we had our computer and we put the clues in, Kussmaul sign plus radiation tattoo marker on the chest, that machine will come up with a diagnosis as you guys did of constrictive pericarditis. Again, a, a machine can do this. A machine can synthesize the clues, but it requires a clinician at the bedside to observe and recognize Kussmaul sign to observe and recognize the tattoo markers. That's why the acquisition of information is so critical in medicine. And here's an up close image of the tattoo marker. It's basically, a, it, usually it's blue colored, a round dot, and it's usually arranged in a field uh, somewhere on the body. And this patient did indeed have constrictive pericarditis. That machine may also output you know, could this patient have had radiation therapy causing valvular disease and leading to right heart failure and Kussmaul sign? Could the radiation therapy have led to interstitial lung disease complicated by core pulmonale leading to a uh, Kussmaul sign on exam? Uh, but again, you want to be the clinician who can identify these clues. Let's move to patient number three. Again, this patient presenting with dyspnea or shortness of breath. What do you notice about this patient's vital signs? Is there anything that stands out to you in particular? <laughs> 
Yes, a high systolic blood pressure coupled with a low diastolic blood pressure, which is known as a wide pulse pressure. This patient has wide pulse pressure. And what hypothesis, what do you normally associate wide pulse pressure with? Aortic regurgitation, exactly, aortic insufficiency. And so you look at the patient's hands and you look at their fingernail beds. And this is a movie that I'm playing for you here. And what do you notice here in the fingernail bed that you're specifically observing for because you have the idea or the hypothesis of aortic insufficiency in your mind? What do you notice about the fingernail beds here? Yes, there's Quinky's pulse. Exactly. Does everybody appreciate that the nail beds are pulsating? Again, I hope that the video is playing as clearly as it, as it is for me. There's an obvious pulsation there in the nail bed and you have Quinky's pulse. And now you have a wide pulse pressure in Quinky's pulse. And now you're really, you really are thinking aortic insufficiency. What if I told you, you know, and this patient presented with heart failure, had elevated jugular venous pressure, had orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and has wide pulse pressure and Quinky's pulse on exam, and you're thinking aortic insufficiency. What if I told you that he did not have a diastolic murmur on exam, and the echocardiogram showed a completely normal aortic valve along with normal systolic function? So what are you thinking now? So no evidence of aortic insufficiency on the echocardiogram, which is a good study, good quality study. Well, it turns out that wide pulse pressure and Quinky's pulse are not specific for aortic regurgitation. They are simply findings of high output physiology or high output state. And uh, Beto has identified arteriovenous fistula. And that is the, one of the answers to my next question for you guys, which is what are, what are the causes of high output physiology, high output state? This patient has a diet now has a concern that there is high output heart failure in this patient high output heart failure. What are the causes of high output heart failure? Fistula is one of them. Beriberi is another one. Sepsis, severe anemia. Exactly. Thyrotoxicosis, you guys are right on. Exactly. And now if you're thinking about, let's say, wet beriberi, if wet beriberi is on your differential, now again, what historical question might you go and ask the patient? What, what is a, a big risk factor for thiamine deficiency? alcohol use. And in fact, you ask this patient about alcohol use and he drinks three to four glasses of wine every day. So he is, consumes heavy amounts of alcohol. And indeed, you measure a thymine level on this patient and it is quite low, making the diagnosis of wet very, very first. He had a right heart cath procedure that demonstrated a cardiac output of 13 liters per minute, which is more than double normal. And so you've made the diagnosis of, of high output heart failure, and then you created some uh, hypotheses from that. Could it be, you know, severe anemia? Could it be thyrotoxicosis? Could it be wet beriberi? And those hypotheses led you to go back and ask patients, the patient certain questions, look for certain physical findings, uh, and send off certain laboratory tests. And that's why this is so important to understand what information you need to acquire and then acquire that information. Under normal circumstances, this patient would have been given the diagnosis of high output heart failure with or excuse me, uh, would have been given the diagnosis of, of heart failure with preserved systolic function, which is not an uncommon diagnosis. And he would have simply been given diuretics and sent home to be treated symptomatically. But recognizing the wide pulse pressure and the Quinky's pulse allowed us to make the diagnosis of, right, of high output heart failure via right heart catheterization, and then subsequently the diagnosis of wet beriberi. And that's why this is so important. And why is it so important to make the diagnosis of wet beriberi? Because it's curable. It's absolutely curable. And with alcohol cessation, so he stopped using alcohol and he was treated with thiamine replacement, you can see how his pulse pressure narrowed over time. So over the course of 28 weeks, his pulse pressure went from uh, right around 100 down to around 60. And so this patient was cured. He no longer needed diuretics, no longer had heart failure. And you know how many clinicians would evaluate this patient and give him the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved systolic function and just given him diuretics and sent him home versus how many clinicians would have noticed that wide pulse pressure, would have known to look at the fingernail bed and recognized the Quinky's pulse 
and then put it all together to make the diagnosis of high output heart failure to cure this patient. That's why it's so important. So again, to make a diagnosis, a clinician has to know what information is important to acquire, has to have the skills to acquire that information, and then has to synthesize those clues to make a diagnosis. So let's focus for a moment on step one, which is knowing what information is important to acquire. So how do we do this? One of my strategies is to create a differential diagnosis. I try to identify a symptom or a physical finding or a laboratory abnormality within the case that I can then generate a differential diagnosis around. The earlier you do this, the better. Why? Because now the questions you ask the patient, the physical findings you look for, the tests you send off are all hypothesis driven. And that's critical in medicine. You can now reference the differential diagnosis that you've created, which is a collection of hypotheses. And now these hypotheses tell you, this is the information that I need to acquire from this case in order to rule in or rule out that hypothesis. So the way I do this in real life is I may visit a patient, interview them, examine them, and I go back to my desk and I, and I create my differential diagnosis. And then that gives me the hypotheses that I need. So for example, let's say I'm seeing a patient with dyspnea and uh, heart failure is in the differential. And I see that and if I hadn't done it already, I would know I need to go ask that patient about weight gain, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. I need to look on exam specifically at the, at the JVP or the jugular venous pressure. I need to listen for that S3 gallop. And that's the way it works in real life. And by the way, the history and the exam are all you need to make most diagnoses and they're free. The history and the exam are absolutely free. Um, you know, you don't want to be the type of doctor that orders every lab test you can imagine on, on every patient. For example, in that patient number three, are we gonna order thiamine levels on every patient that we ever evaluate? No, we're definitely not gonna do that. Uh, we're, we ordered it in that case because we had a hypothesis that he could have thiamine deficiency and indeed the test proved our hypothesis correct. So if you order a bunch of labs and, and tests and imaging studies on, on every patient you see, you're gonna do them a big disservice. It comes at a high cost, both literally because these tests cost money and figuratively, because once you start testing patients unnecessarily, testing begets more testing and sometimes begets procedures. For example, you order that CAT scan unnecessarily on a patient and you're gonna find maybe a spot in the liver that was otherwise benign and doing nothing, no harm to the patient. And now the patient undergoes a liver biopsy and, and it could you know, incur um, a complication from that biopsy. And, and, now, and now he or she is fighting for their life in the ICU. So it comes at a high cost here. You wanna be part of diagnostic reasoning is to be judicious, be a steward when it comes to ordering lab tests. So you only order the tests that you need to order. So let's talk about the differential diagnosis, which should be more than just a list. The differential diagnosis should be organized in some way. And the non-medical example I like to give is imagine if I asked you to name all the states in the United States of America as quickly as you could randomly. Well, you'd get going for you know, a while and eventually you become disorganized and uh, slow down and come to a stop. If instead of doing it randomly, you had a method behind it. So let's say you said, okay, I'm gonna do this alphabetically. I'm gonna start with the, with the states that start with letter A then move to B, then C, then D, and so forth. Or you did it geographically and you said, okay, I'm gonna start in the Northwest, then I'm gonna move to the Southwest, then Northeast, then Southeast. You'd be a lot better off. And the same is true in medicine. We're asked as internal medicine doctors to memorize long differential diagnoses for so many problems. There are 50 things that cause dyspnea, 50 things that cause chest pain, 50 things that cause anemia. There's a long list of systemic vasculitides. And I would encourage you not to make a list, a linear list here, but you should, you should organize this list in some way. It'll help you. So don't do this. You should organize that list. And, and, and an organized differential diagnosis is exactly what a framework is. That is, that is uh, all a framework is. It's an organized differential diagnosis. And here is the differential for, or the framework for systemic vasculitis organized by size of blood vessel involved. We have large vessel, medium vessel, small vessel. If I have this in my mind, it's much easier for me to recall this list. Um, and it's much easier to approach a patient with systemic vasculitis if I have this framework in mind. And that's one of the benefits of the framework system is it, it helps you with memory and recall. Um, they did studies in the 50, in 1950s and 60s where they gave one group of individuals a list of words that were linearly listed and at random and asked them to memorize that list. They gave the same list of words to a different group 
And, and instead of being a single list, those words were organized in some way like this. This is an example of uh, a list of minerals that were organized into a framework. And the group that had the benefit, and again, both groups were asked to memorize these words and later tested on it. The group that had the benefit of a, of a framework or organization were much more successful at memorizing that list of words. So having a framework for a problem uh, will allow you to, to recall and, and remember that differential diagnosis a lot more easily. Another sort of benefit from having a framework is it, depending on the framework, can suggest a diagnostic workup. So if we look at the framework for systemic vasculitis and we look at the small vessel arm, that subdivides into whether patients are ANCA positive or ANCA negative, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. And so if I'm approaching a patient with small, with uh, what I think, who I think may have small vessel vasculitis, and I have this framework in mind, it automatically suggests to me a serologic study to send. And the same is true for the framework for pleural effusion, which divides causes into transidates and exudates, which is of course based on lights criteria. And so if I have this framework in mind and I'm approaching a patient with a pleural effusion, it automatically tells me that number one, I have to sample that fluid with a thoracentesis. And number two, I have to send that fluid for protein and LDH in order to calculate lights criteria. Here is the framework for hyponatremia. Same thing, if we look at the hypotonic arm, this subdivides by volume status, hypovolemic, euvolemic, hypervolemic. And if I'm approaching a patient with hyponatremia and I have this framework in mind, it automatically tells me that I need to pay close attention to volume status when I'm examining this patient. So those are the two big benefits of the framework system. It will help you remember the diagnosis, the differential diagnosis, and it will help you potentially on a diagnostic pursuit. Now let's take these principles that we just learned about and apply them to a case. And this is a case from the book. And you'll notice that I've concealed some of the information in this case because, again, I don't want to just supply you with all the clues that you need to just do step three, which is synthesizing the clues to make a diagnosis. We want to emphasize how important it is to uh, know what information is important to acquire and then acquire that information. So what we'll do is we'll, re we'll read the bare bones of the case, then we'll generate a framework around a problem in this case, and then we'll use that framework as our collection of hypotheses to ask and uh, look for certain findings on exam, and then we'll try to solve the case. So this is a 51-year-old man with a history of chronic hepatitis C infection, complicated by cirrhosis, who presents to the emergency department with shortness of breath. He has been followed by a hepatologist for management of hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, and esophageal varices, which have been stable for several years. The patient has a history of shortness of breath that typically resolves following large volume paracentesis, which he has occasionally required. However, over the past few months, the patient has noticed progressive dyspnea despite control of the ascites. Heart rate is 100 beats per minute, and the respiratory rate is 24 breaths per minute. Hemoglobin oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry is 85% on room air with a patient in the upright position. Arterial blood gas on room air shows that the pH is 7.48. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 32 millimeters of mercury and the partial pressure of oxygen is 56 millimeters of mercury. What is the most likely cause of hypoxemia in this patient? Okay, so let's pick a problem from this case to build our framework around. And you could pick a few different problems. I would say dyspnea and hypoxemia are the obvious choices in this case, and either of them are good choices. Sometimes, depending on the case, if it's a complex case with multiple problems, multiple disparate problems, it's very helpful to generate multiple frameworks for each of those problems in a case and see where the overlap, which, what conditions are present in each of the frameworks, and then focus on those problems. That's similar to how a Venn diagram works. So for the sake of this talk, we're gonna choose hypoxemia and we're gonna build our framework around hypoxemia in this case to try to solve it. First of all, to try to understand what information is important for us to gather from this patient. And then we take those clues, synthesize them and make a diagnosis. So before we get to the framework, a little bit on hypoxemia. So hypoxemia is a physiologic state in which the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood is abnormally low, defined as less than 80 millimeters of mercury. And we all remember this uh, oxygen saturation curve of hemoglobin, where on the x-axis, we have the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, and on the y-axis, the percentage of hemoglobin that is, that is saturated. And obviously, as the partial pressure of oxygen goes up in blood, so does the percent saturation of hemoglobin. But it doesn't do so in a linear fashion. There's an S shape to this curve. 
And the numbers that I commit to memory here are 27 millimeters of mercury. Why? Because that corresponds to 50% hemoglobin saturation. And the other number I like to, to memorize here is 60 millimeters of mercury. Why? Because that corresponds to about 9% uh, hemoglobin saturation. And so those are just two nice frames of reference to think about when you're approaching hypoxemia and thinking about the partial pressure of, of oxygen in arterial blood. So let's begin to build our framework for hypoxemia. And the first branch point in the framework is whether the patient has a normal AA gradient or an elevated AA gradient. So that begs the question, what is an AA gradient? An AA gradient is the difference in partial pressure of oxygen between the alveoli, which is the big A, and arterial blood, which is the little a. So it, can I ask you guys to all mute your uh, microphones? There's a little bit of background noise. If you can mute your microphones, that would be great. But uh, I would like to learn how the dog has to be fluid. If you can mute your microphone, that would be great. Excellent. Now, this is the way the body works. So we inhale oxygen in our alveolar space into our lungs. And we have a certain amount of oxygen here. That's the big A. And it diffuses across into the capillary and into the artery. And that's the little A. So the AA gradient is the difference in oxygen content between the lungs and the artery. Okay. How do we obtain big AO2? Or how do we know how much oxygen is in the lungs? How do we obtain little AO2? How, how do we know how much oxygen is in the, the arteries? Well, big AO2, alveolar uh, oxygen content, is measured, calculated using the alveolar gas equation. And little AO2 is measured by sampling arterial blood. So let's focus for a moment on big AO2. Okay, so this is using the alveolar gas equation. And I know sometimes it, it can be challenging to look at these equations, but this is one of the equations in medicine that I would really encourage everyone to commit to memory. It, it's very good for understanding physiology, much like cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. That's excellent for understanding hemodynamics. The alveolar gas equation is very helpful for understanding hypoxemia. So let's go through this equation. So uh, the first question is how much what, what is the fraction of inspired oxygen of room air? That's FiO2, and that's 21%. What about barometric pressure at sea level? Who can tell me what barometric pressure is at sea level? Anybody know? Seven hundred and sixty millimeters of mercury, or seven sixty torr. That's exactly right. Now, in Portland, Oregon, where we're pretty much at sea level, it's seven hundred and sixty millimeters of mercury, but you know, in Mexico City, where you guys are, I, I did my homework. I looked this up, and you guys are at quite a high elevation. Does anybody know what the atmospheric pressure is in? Yep, exactly, around 580. Exactly, yep. Okay, how about the water vapor pressure? That's 47. The normal partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood, what is, what is normal CO2? Yeah, exactly, right around 40 millimeters of mercury. And actually, that's an interesting question. I was just about to ask in Mexico City, I might imagine that it's actually a little bit lower because of the hype, you know, hyperventilation that occurs to compensate for the, the elevation. That's very good to know. And uh, anybody know what the respiratory quotient is? It's usually around 0 0.8. Exactly. Nice job, you guys. And this depends somewhat on diet, but on average, it's around 0 0.8. So what is my what, how much oxygen are my lungs seeing here in Portland, Oregon? So we'll go, we'll plug in the numbers, 21%, 760, 47, 40, 0 0.8. And we come up with a, with a uh, partial pressure of oxygen in my lungs of around 100 millimeters of mercury. And let's say we, we have zero, I have no AA gradient. So whatever my lungs are seeing is diffusing across into my artery. And here we go. That's why I, I'm satting at 99 to 100% because my arteries have somewhere close to 100 millimeters of mercury partial pressure of oxygen in them. What's your PaO2 in Mexico City? Well, I've substituted 760 millimeters of mercury, and in place of that, I put 580. And uh, I didn't make the correction for PaCO2, which I've now learned, uh, thanks to you guys, is no a normal in Mexico City is around 30. So we would have to recalculate this a little bit. So this, this value would actually be a little bit higher than 62. 
but for the sake of this uh, presentation, we'll, we'll go with this number around 60. And so in Mexico City, this is a normal um, partial pressure of oxygen and, and uh, hemoglobin saturation. It turns out that we're allowed up to a little bit of an AA gradient. So, and it depends on age. At age 20, we're allowed a gradient of up to about 17. And uh, all the way up to uh, an AA gradient of about 38 is normal in, a, in an 80 year old patient. So let's now approach and talk about the side of the framework in which there's a normal AA gradient in a patient is hypoxemic. This may seem paradoxical to some. You may wonder, how is it that a patient could have a normal AA gradient and still be hypoxemic? Well, it all comes back to the alveolar gas equation and the fact that the little A is at the mercy of the big A. So if something is compromising how much oxygen we're seeing in the lungs, then it will, it will compromise how much oxygen our arterial blood has in it. And again, it comes back to the alveolar gas equation. So if, if either of these two terms, if, if the uh, amount of the partial pressure of oxygen that we're inspiring goes down, or the amount of carbon dioxide in our blood goes up, both of either one of these situations will cause the, the big AO2 to go down. And again, the little a is at the mercy of the big A. And so that would be anything that causes reduced partial pressure of inspired oxygen or hypoventilation. So let's, let's show you, some of you may, still may be confused about how a normal AA gradient could cause hypoxemia or could be associated with hypoxemia. Well, let's take an example of a patient with a PaCO2 of 80, and they're in Portland, Oregon here. So all things are the same except for 40, we're gonna put 80 in. And that comes out to a, a partial pressure of oxygen of 50 millimeters of mercury. Even if this person has a completely normal AA gradient of zero, so whatever is in here is diffusing across perfectly well, well, they're hypoxemic because they would only have an, a, a partial pressure of oxygen in their arterial blood of 50 millimeters of mercury, and they would be satting in the mid 80s. So this person has a normal AA gradient, but is hypoxemic. So what are, I'm gonna ask you guys, what are the causes of reduced partial pressure of inspired oxygen? We've already mentioned a few. And what are the causes of hypoventilation? Can you guys name some of those? Yes, exactly. So on the left side, so high altitude is a classic cause. Pollution in the air, you know, when we blow up fireworks on, on Independence Day, we pollute the air. Hypoventilation side, obesity, uh, hypoventilation syndrome, chest wall deformity, exactly. Opioid intoxication, that's a big one. We see that so commonly in the hospital, either benzodiazepines or opioids, neuromuscular disorders. Perfect. That's exactly right. You guys are right on the money. Now let's shift gears and go to the arm of the framework in which there's an elevated AA gradient. So there is something preventing the oxygen here from getting across and going here. So there's a, di a big difference between how much oxygen is in our lungs and how much oxygen is in the artery. Turns out there are four basic mechanisms for how this can occur. Number one, you can have VQ mismatch in the form of dead space. So here your V is quite good. Your aeration in the lungs is excellent. So you have good oxygenation in your lung, but there's something preventing blood flow to that part of the lung. And so you have uh, no Q. So you have big, a good V, but no Q. That's VQ mismatch in the form of dead space, which will cause hypoxemia. You can also have VQ mismatch in the form of physiologic shunt. So here your Q is great. You have good blood flow, but your V is poor. Something has filled the alveoli and, and so oxygen, it, can, it cannot oxygenate properly. You can have a situation where your V is excellent, your Q is excellent, but something, maybe fibrosis or something is preventing oxygen from being able to diffuse across the membrane. And then finally, your V is excellent, your Q is excellent, the membrane is fine, but some, you have this shunt going across taking deoxygenated blood across to the other side of the capillary. Now, can you guys name some conditions that would cause dead, each one of these mechanisms? Let's just name one or two in each category. What's the classic cause of dead space where you have blocked blood flow to a part of the lung? Pulmonary embolism, perfect. How about physiologic shunt? What, would, uh, what can fill the alveoli thereby causing physiologic shunt? What conditions? Yet yeah, pneumonia is a great cause. This could be pus. It could be water in the form of pulmonary edema or heart failure. It could be ARDS, exactly. It could be blood in, in the form of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. The alveoli could be collapsed. 
So from atelectasis, good. How about impaired diffusion? We have some fibrosis here, maybe causing an issue with uh, interstitial lung disease, perfect. And then where are the two locations in the body that these um, anatomic shunts typically show up? Where do patients develop these large shunts that cause hypoxemia? What are the two organ systems? You can have uh, exactly intrapulmonary shunt, you can have intracardiac shunt. Those are the two main locations of shunts. And here is the full framework for thinking about hypoxemia. And here's our differential diagnosis. We've created up now a bunch of hypotheses. Let's go back to the case now. And we wanna know, the first question is, is what is the AA gradient in this case? That'll help us figure out what the diagnosis is. So if we go back and we realize that the, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in this case is 32 millimeters of mercury. And so we calculate the big AO2 using that number. And we come up with a number of 110 millimeters of mercury. Now we want to know what's the little a, and it turns out it's 56 on that ABG measurement. So what's the AA gradient? It's 110 minus 56, it's 54 millimeters of mercury, which is abnormal in any case. This person is in his 50s, so his AA gradient is almost twice normal. So we now know that we're dealing with this arm, this side of the framework. So here's our differential diagnosis, and this is a collection of hypotheses. And when you have a hypothesis, that tells you what information you need to acquire from the case. So let's pick a couple of these examples, and I'm going to ask you guys to tell me what historical questions you would ask or what physical findings you would look for with that hypothesis in mind. So the first one here is let's focus on pulmonary embolism. So what, what questions would you ask a patient if you're concerned about pulmonary embolism? Hmm. Recent surgery, exactly. Yes, so thinking about trauma, stasis. Yes, a history of cancer, perfect. You might ask them about uh, a long plane flight. You know, uh, that's where, are we gonna ask every patient we ever interview whether they've been on a long plane flight recently? No, we're not. We'd only ask that question if we are concerned about pulmonary embolism. What physical findings might you look for? Well, here you might look for that DVT. You know, you're looking for a red swollen leg. You might listen to the heart, specifically listening for a loud P2 that would be consistent with pulmonary hypertension from a PE. Perfect. How about pneumonia? What questions would you ask a patient with uh, that you, your concern might have pneumonia? Fever, cough, perfect. And on exam, you're going to be looking specifically, that lung exam is going to be critical. You're looking specifically for um, you know, dullness to percussion, um, egophony, you're uh, listening for crackles, tubular breath sounds, all of that stuff. How about interstitial lung disease? What questions might you ask a patient you're concerned about interstitial lung disease? Yes, so dyspnea with effort. Yeah, what, what job do they have? What, are, what is their career? What exposures have they had in their life? Do they smoke? Do they have connective tissue disease? Thinking about all the diseases like dermatomyositis and rheumatoid arthritis that can present with interstitial lung disease. Beautiful. Now on exam, you're gonna be listening for crackles, not just crackles or rowels, but Velcro rowels on exam. And don't forget about testing. This differential diagnosis allows you to, to test with you know, a hypothesis-driven method in mind. So you know, what would you order if you're concerned about interstitial lung disease? You might order a high-resolution CT scan or you might order pulmonary function tests. Perfect. Now, what diagnosis in here, and somebody has already said it actually, are we thinking about in a patient, our, remember our patient has cirrhosis. So what condition in, in, this, in this list would you specifically hone in on and, and be concerned about um, in a patient with cirrhosis presenting with dyspnea? Hepatopulmonary syndrome, exactly. Now, what questions might you ask a patient if you're concerned that they might have hepatopulmonary syndrome? Well, not quite orthopnea. It's a great thought, Luis. Yes, platypnea. You quickly corrected yourself. Nice. You, and what is platypnea? That's okay. Platypnea, I, know, I knew what you meant. You, you quickly corrected yourself. Platypnea is dyspnea uh, when the patient is uh, upright in position and it improves when they lie flat. Okay, the opposite of orthopnea. Now, on exam, you're going to be looking for orthodeoxia, which is the finding, the physical finding of hypoxemia in the upright position that improves when they lie flat. How about, uh, what's another exam finding if you're concerned about a shunt? Because hepatopulmonary syndrome really is a shunt. It's listed under physiologic shunt here because you get dilation 
of the blood vessels at the base of the, the lungs. And when they're upright, because of gravity, most of the blood flow is going to be at the base to the lung, the west zone three of the lung, and your shunt fraction increases. They can also develop as a result uh, AVMs at the base of the lung. So hepatopulmonary syndrome is either in the physiologic shunt ca category or the intrapulmonary shunt, anatomic shunt category. And so what study would you order to prove your hypothesis that this patient might have hepatopulmonary syndrome? Anybody know? Yes, you can order an echocardiogram with bubbles, exactly. And, uh, and so, you know, you, uh, you order the TTE with bubble study and, and that can prove your hypothesis. Did we mention the other physical exam finding that you might see in somebody with a, with a shunt? Maybe on their hands? What would you look for? Clubbing, perfect. So let's go back to our case and now we have some of this information filled in for us. So we had most of the first paragraph, but, we, but now we have that the breathing seems to improve when the patient lies on his back. Okay, are you gonna ask about platypnea in every patient that you interview? No, but you had a hypothesis here and you extracted that information. Um, we had some of the exam, but now we know that there are multiple spider, in, oh, and in fact, we have the finding of orthodeoxia. The hemoglobin saturation is 85% in the upright position and improves to 96% in the supine position. So orthodeoxia is present. There are spider angiomas on the chest, not surprising he has cirrhosis. The jugular venous pressure is seven, so normal. So again, our, one of our hypotheses was, could the alveoli be filled with pulmonary edema? And now that seems less likely because the, the JVP is normal. The lungs are also clear to auscultation, that helps us. Here's an image of the patient's hands shown in figure 46.1. What, what is this image showing us? Clubbing, exactly. And we looked specifically for clubbing because hepatopulmonary syndrome was on our differential. And here is the bubble study that you asked for, that you ordered. You're not ordering this on everybody, but you ordered it in this case because you had a hypothesis. And so the way the study works is you inject these, these micro bubbles on the right side of the heart, and here you can see them. It's the um, hyperechoic material in the right ventricle. Now, normally the right ventricle is gonna pump the blood to the lungs, and those bubbles will dissipate in the lungs. So they should never show up on the left side of the heart. If they do, you know that you have a right to left shunt somewhere, whether it's intracardiac or intrapulmonary. And the way you tell the difference is timing. So if, it, if the bubbles show up in the left heart right away within two or three beats, you know it's an intracardiac shunt, like a patent frame in ovale or an ASD or a VSD. If it is, uh, takes a little while, like in this case, eight beats later, then you've narrowed it down to the lungs. And so this shows that there's an intrapulmonary shunt. So what's our diagnosis? Hepatopulmonary syndrome, exactly. So we, you know, we developed a framework, we developed a differential diagnosis, we use that differential diagnosis to, to understand what questions that we have to ask the patient and acquire from the patient on exam and test the patient for. And uh, then we acquired those clues and then we synthesize those clues to make a diagnosis. And that's the summary of the talk. We, uh, I, I want to emphasize that diagnostic reasoning is the acquisition and use of clues to make a diagnosis with an emphasis on acquisition. Choosing a framework early on in a case allows you to perform a hypothesis-driven workup as you guys did today. Thank you very much for having me. Here are my references. And um, for other diagnostic reasoning resources, again, there's the textbook. Every, every chapter, there's 50 chapters in the book. Every chapter starts off with a case, just like uh, the case you saw here. And it, um, you know, uh, builds a framework through the course of the chapter, and uh, you're left with a full framework, and, and you've learned some clinical pearls along the way. We do things on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook uh, that are very um, oriented towards diagnostic reasoning. There's a couple podcasts that I would recommend, Clinical Problem Solvers, Core IM. Gurpreet Dhaliwal is a, is a master clinician at UCSF uh, here in the, in the States, and if, if you ever have a chance to see him in person, sometimes he does the Stump the Professor style uh, lecture where he's, he solves a case and works through it and he really does a masterful job. Human DX is an application that I would recommend. And finally, Physical Diagnosis uh, PDX is a website that we're uh, creating that will, uh, our goal is to, to show all the physical findings that you can imagine. And so we wanna equip clinicians with not only, you know, do they know to look at the hands for arachnodactyly, but 
because of our site, they can identify what arachnidactyly looks like. They can recognize it because we want to show all of the physical findings. And so clinicians are familiar with what they look like. And that's the end of the talk. I really appreciate you guys uh, joining and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to answer questions at this point. Um, uh, Fernando, uh, I'll let you uh, direct this, this part of the talk. Great. Thank you very much for your great lecture, Dr. Mansour. No sé si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, algún comentario que agregar para antes de concluir la, la sesión. My pleasure, Fernando. And feel free to uh, unmute yourself to ask a question. You can also ask a question in the chat. I've got the chat box pulled up here so I can see what you're asking. Thank you. How do I incorporate these principles in my teaching session? So great question. And I, um, I think that again, as I mentioned early on in the talk that I think students and residents should really be focused mostly on the diagnostic process. You can always look up treatment and management. So I, I think we should spend less time memorizing treatment and management and teaching treatment and management. So this is exactly how I teach. Um, I really uh, try to, um, you know, identify a problem in a patient that's on our team. If a patient comes in with hypercalcemia, you know, I want to talk about hypercalcemia. Or if a patient comes in with ascites, I want to talk about ascites. And I will create that, that framework for the students. And I, we will talk about ascites and we'll talk about uh, portal hypertension causes and non-portal hypertension causes and how you determine that using the SAG. And then I ask the, the this, you know, we talk about portal hypertension being pre- hepatic, intrahepatic, or post-hepatic. We create the framework and then the students fill in the answers. And then we talk about, okay, if you're concerned about, you know, uh, cirrhosis, what questions would you ask the patient? What physical findings would you look for? And that's how I teach and how I teach the concept of understanding what information is important to acquire and how you acquire that information. And that this is exactly how I teach. I teach using these frameworks. Um, and then, of course, you know, skill number two, which is, uh, or step number two, which is acquiring that uh, information, I teach at the bedside. I show these physical findings to students when I can. I practice, you know, how you extract historical pieces of information from uh, the patients. But thank you for that question. ¿Alguien más tiene algún comentario o, o pregunta? You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope to visit you guys someday. Well, it seems like there are no more questions, doctor. Um, we, we're really, really grateful um, on having you here today with us. And I, I hope we could arrange um, one one or, or or more sessions like like this one in in the future and uh you're very welcome here at our institution thank you very much muchas gracias bueno pues muchas gracias a, a todos por, por conectarse y, y pues que tengan buen día okay thank you so much fernando really appreciate it and uh i'm happy to come back anytime Hasta luego. Gracias. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.